Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs comes to order. Uh, Senator Scott, uh, welcome. The three witnesses, welcome. Costs are far too high for Americans. Corporations are finding more and more ways to raise those costs to boost their own profits. We've talked about how every time Americans go to a grocery store, they pay for corporate stock buybacks and executive bonuses. Last week, we looked at how companies use the latest technologies to jack up prices for consumers. This week, we look at junk fees. These are surprise, although not that much of a surprise anymore, often last-minute charges that drive up the cost of products, have no justification or connection to anything other than their quest for profits. Think about that hotel room you booked that has a bunch of mysterious charges at the end. Or that time you paid your credit card bill over the phone so you wouldn't be late, but were charged a convenience fee. The only thing that fee is convenient for is the bank's bottom line. Or let's say you're looking for an apartment, you finally find one with affordable rent, but when you get a look at the lease, you realize that between the maintenance fee and the trash fee and the mysterious convenience fee, the actual rent you'll be charged each month is out of your budget now. These hidden add-ons, surcharges, fees, they're all junk fees. They're extra costs that inflate the price you pay but add no real value. They're often hidden. They're only disclosed when it's time to pay. Consumers know what they can afford. That's why we all shop based on price. But when the real price is hidden through undisclosed junk fees, how are consumers supposed to find the lowest price? The answer is they often can't. We hear a lot about personal responsibility and consumer financial literacy in this committee, but no amount of financial education is going to protect someone from a tactic that's meant to purposely hide the real purpose of a product or service. They hide the price, that's the whole point. Junk fees make a mockery of free and fair markets. $32 here, $45 there, sprinkle in a 10%, or I'm sorry, a $10 service fee before you know it, a product you thought was the most affordable option actually is the most expensive. Without junk fees, consumers would keep more of their hard-earned money. They'd be able to better find the lowest price, which is how you really should promote competition to bring costs down. That's why the CFPB has taken long overdue steps to reduce costs and fees and make them more transparent. CFPB took a major step toward reducing costs for consumers when it issues its credit card late fee rule. Credit card late fees are the most costly and frequently applied junk fee. According to one report, one in five adult Americans, an estimated 52 million people paid a credit card fee last year, credit card late fee last year. By law, credit card late fees are supposed to be reasonable and proportional. That's what the law says, reasonable and proportional to the cost that companies incur for late payments. So be clear, there are massive trillion dollar Wall Street companies. The idea that you, you are missing your payment due date by a day or two is imposing some huge cost on the credit company, credit card company, is just patently ridiculous. Sure enough, CFPB found that credit card companies are charging consumers more than five times their cost. By 2022, that meant credit card companies charge consumers $14.5 billion in late fees. That's up $3 billion over the previous year, and who knows what next year will be. The new action by the CFPB will lower credit card late fees that the largest credit card issuers can charge down to just $8 if it stands. This will save Americans more than $10 billion in fees each year. Of course, of course, the biggest banks oppose it. They trot out the same old complaints we always hear every time anyone tries to do anything that might just cut into Wall Street profits just even a little bit. They whined in 2009 when we passed the Credit Act, or excuse me, we passed the CARD Act to lower some fees and increase transparency. Surprise, surprise, the sky didn't fall. Consumers still have access to credit, and of course, Credit card companies still make billions in profits. Of course, it's not just credit card late fees. Junk fees are piled on top of all sorts of services and products. CFPB found that some auto loan services charge $1,000 in repossession fees, almost three times the average repossession cost. Unsurprisingly, some owners never recovered their cars because $1,000 is an amount many working families cannot afford out of the blue. Rental housing. Junk fees that are added to the advertised rent can make the actual rent paid unaffordable. We've seen cases where the advertised rent grows 
hundreds, hundreds of dollars a month once all the fees were out on top of the rent, application fees, utility deposits, trash fees, fees for the young man, a young man in my office pays a fee for the honor of paying his rent, fee after fee after fee after fee. Imagine a family getting approved for a place they think they can afford, but then getting several hundred dollars of surprise, surprise added on fees, and surprise add-on fees when they go to sign their lease. Most renters can't afford these massive price increases, but they may not have an option once they've paid all the upfront costs and set their move-in date. Be clear, the entire point of these fees is to hide the true cost. They could just, lent, they could just rent, list the rent for what it is, but they don't because they want to make it impossible for families to actually, as they survey where they want to move, to actually find the lowest rent. It's not, it's not a free, fair market. It's a rigged system. We need to continue working to expose and crack down on those fees that are raising costs in Americans to push already high corporate profits even higher. We need to defend the CFPB's work that has refunded $260 million to consumers for unlawful junk fees already, save that money, and will save consumers billions in the future. Corporations raising these prices have ar armies of lobbyists to fight for them. At the beginning, I said people, when they go into the grocery store to shop, uh, they're paying for stock buybacks and bonuses for executives, not too different in this world, in the banking world, in the apartment world, in the car repossession world. Our job is to stand up to those corporate lobbyists to work for everyone else so that consumers can actually keep their hard-earned money. Sarah Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being with us today. At last week's hearing, we heard from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that the high prices Americans are paying as they struggle to put food on the table and face mounting debt are the result of greedflation and shrinkflation. And today, it's a similar story. This time, the boogeyman is so-called junk fees, and these fees are to blame for the obvious economic pain Americans are feeling. Not skyrocketing inflation, not increasing global instability, and certainly not the slush fund known as the Inflation Reduction Act. Clearly, there is no shortage of finger pointing for the failure of Bidenomics, or as I like to call it, brokenomics, because that's what's happening to the average American family. My Democratic colleagues and this administration have deployed a herd of scapegoats to deflect blame for the economic harm they have brought upon American households. Instead of taking responsibility for the real consequences of unchecked spending and increased regulation across the economy, the Biden administration would rather throw a towel over the mirror and say, not me. Sure, it might be easy or even politically expedient to slap a label of junk or excessive on additional costs for legitimate products and services in an effort to villainize business in America so that they themselves do not have to face the reality that Bidenomics, Brokenomics, is causing devastation after devastation after devastation upon the shoulders of the American people. But it is long past time that Democrats stop playing political games with price controls and trying to micromanage the business operations, especially when the real outcome of these feel-good games is reducing access to credit and limiting economic opportunity for those who need it most. That's why I introduced a CRA resolution to overturn the CFPB's credit card penalty fee rule. Let's be clear about what this rule will mean for American families. It will result in lower credit limits and higher interest rates for borrowers. It will result in new fees for services that are currently provided free of charge. Finally, and perhaps worst of all, this rule will cut off access to credit and stymie financial inclusion for the families who need it most. Sadly, I wasn't surprised when the CFPB finalized the credit card penalty fee just days before the President's State of the Union address. 
That's the politics of this administration. Actions that sound good as talking points, just like the billions of dollars of student loan forgiveness, but they are truly divorced from economic reality. And it's not just the financial sector. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. That's what astounds me. This administration's rhetorical hypocrisy. The White House has claimed that a junk fee is a charge designed either to confuse or deceive consumers. Ironically enough, two of the recent targets within the committee's jurisdiction, overdraft and credit card late fees, are two of the most highly regulated and transparent business practices in any industry. The credit card late fees and overdraft fees we are discussing here today are in fact not illegal and are heavily regulated. And while we are on the subject of regulation, if Democrats actually wanted to address the junk fees that American families are facing, a good place to start would be the, the enormous costs that consumers are paying due to the Biden administration's regulatory onslaught. It's an albatross around every family trying to make ends meet. Since he took office, the total cost of President Biden's regulatory nightmare, the mountain of red tape, is $1.37 trillion. That's $1.37 trillion, T as in Tom, dollars. Paid by everyday families in the form of higher prices because of these new regulations. This contributes to the increased cost for food, housing, vehicles, and all the other basics a family must have just to survive. And this happens while inflation is raging. If my friends on the other side of the aisle were truly interested in helping the American family, the American people, this hearing would be about finding solutions to tame the inflation that has increased the cost of goods by almost 20% since President Biden took office. We should be discussing how real average hourly wages have decreased under this administration. Remember, 52 paychecks in a row where inflation was higher than wage increase. And we would be discussing how President Biden has promised to let the TCJA, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, expire next year, which would result in a $2.5 trillion tax increase on the American family. But that's not the conversation we're having today, unfortunately. In closing, it is my hope that we will hear today how misguided the administration's attempts are to push the financial services industry into only offering a one-size-fits-all products when we should be really focusing on providing solutions to the financial hardships facing Americans. And let me just close with one example. Everyone I know hates paying a late fee. But the late fee is oftentimes the one thing that encourages us to take our bills more seriously. Because ultimately, a late fee represents a late payment. And if you are late on your payment, ultimately, your credit score goes down, which means that the cost of borrowing goes up, undeniably. If we really want to save Americans more money, we should focus not on these fees that encourages better payment history so your credit score goes up and your interest rates go down. We should focus on the cost of gas up 40%. We should focus on the cost of energy up 30%. We should focus on the cost of food up 20%, not on late fees. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, three witnesses today. First witness, Adam Rust, Director of Financial Services, the Consumer Federation of America. Welcome, Mr. Rust. Thank you. Uh, uh, hang on one sec. Sorry. Our next, sorry. Our next witness is Ms. Karen Madry, President and CEO of Athena Federal Credit Union, headquartered in Marion, Indiana. Welcome, Ms. Madry. Uh, final witness is Mr. Santiago Suero. He's Senior Policy Analyst in the Economic Policy Team at Unidos U.S. Uh, Mr. Rust, now, please. 
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue today. My name is Adam Rust. I am the Director of Financial Services at the Consumer Federation of America. CFA is an association of approximately 250 groups from across the United States. Founded in 1968, our mission is to advance the consumer interest through research, advocacy, and education. Today I'm going to talk about junk fees and explain their harm on consumers and the economy. And I'm going to talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's important work to address these issues. You know, at the heart of it, junk fees are about power. They're about the imbalance between big banks and smaller consumers. Large banks with tens of billions of dollars in their boardrooms, or hundreds of billions or trillions, and private equity and corporate landlords with millions of single family homes are talking about how junk fees are gonna be what brings home an earnings beat for them. To hear on the talk radio shows that they've booyah on earnings but for consumers in their dining rooms, junk fees are an entirely different matter. Junk fees are, are what is going to keep them from bringing home groceries this year. Uh, today, renters are focusing on housing increases. Anyone who has more month than paycheck knows how harmful these junk fees are to, are to their households. So this is a zero-sum game in the end, and the costs are high. Junk fees including credit card late fees, amounted to $14.5 billion last year in overdraft in NSF, $7.7 billion. I want to make a few top-line points. First, in the credit card late fees rule and in the overdraft proposal, the CFPB has tailored regulations that focus on the largest financial institutions only. Only card issuers with more than 1 million active accounts will be affected by the rule, effectively between 30 and 35 large issuers out of the more than 4,000 institutions that ins issue credit cards. And it's similarly with the overdraft proposal, it only applies to institutions with more than $10 billion in assets. To critics who contend that disclosures are enough, I say no. The honest truth is that we need to understand that credit cards are marketed based on rewards, images of beach vacations and celebrity spokespersons, and the penalty fees are buried in fine print. And it's the same way with overdraft. No one shops for a bank account with the intention of failing to use the, the service in a way that meets their goals. They, they're, they're caught by surprise. Um, too often, consumers do use overdraft, but it's by accident. CFPB research reveals that many consumers who have experienced an overdraft fee have an alternative source of credit. And I want to underscore that the CFPB has been deliberate about doing research to understand the credit card market. Congress instructed the CFPB to ensure that penalty fees are reasonable and proportional to cost. By closing these loop loopholes, the CFPB is living up to its mission to put consumers first. Additionally, we believe that reliance on penalty fees is ultimately something that undermines trust in the banking system. 9% of account holders pay 80% of overdraft fees. It saddens me that our payment system has been designed in such a way that the, the least well-off pay an outsized share of the overall cost. And we must remember that because they have been granted a charter, financial institutions have received a privilege, and they have a responsibility with that. And we should also remember that the Federal Reserve's payment system is something that comes with that. The privileges of a, of a charter to meet the convenience and needs of communities where they do business is an essential truth to remember. But penalty fees undermine true financial inclusion. In the midst of an affordable housing crisis, renters today typically face a dizzying array of fees. Those fees render safe and decent housing one step further away because rent is already high and these late fees only add to the cost. You know, the simple lease of 20 years ago has been replaced by a new structure where rent is only one of the costs. Fees are partitioned and consumers may not know all of the fees at the time that they consider filling out an application. And an application could cost more than $100 for each applicant on the lease. There can be fees to sign the lease, fees to move in, fees to move out, fees to pay rent electronically, fees to remove a, a co-worker, a, co, a co, co-resident from the lease. And often essential services are included, uh, also have their own fees, such as trash fees, fees to receive mail, uh, and these are fees that should be included in the all-in cost up front. 
I just want to say that the stakes are high, and these problems are actually interdependent. When junk fees trap a home, uh, when junk fees track residents in an unaffordable lease, they may be vulnerable to eviction. And penalty fees, particularly ones that are a surprise and may come just before the rent is due, are perhaps particularly the most dangerous ones that could lead to evictions. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Uh, Ms. Madry, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and the other members of the committee. My name is Karen Madry, and I am the President and CEO of AFINA Federal Credit Union, located in Marion, Indiana. AFINA is a federally chartered credit union with $99 million in assets, three branches, and we serve just over 8,000 members. AFINA's mission is to help families who are financially vulnerable to achieve financial wealth and endure a, a legacy. We do not exist just to make profits. We are very focused on serving the needs of our community. First, I'd like to address the term junk fees. Junk fees is a made up word and it is not in statute. We heard a lot of comments about junk fees in various industries. I would argue that in the financial services market that those fees differ. Um, credit union fee programs are regulated by federal and state government and the reduction of fee income would ultimately result in the reduction of services to our members. I can also share that in the credit union space, uh, fee, data shows that fee income is at a 32 year low. The CFPB's actions um, really want to impact overdraft protection. They would make it seem that this is a predatory way that we serve our members. My members would argue that this is a, they are paying for a service that is valuable to them. Overdraft protection provides a lifeline for my members and it gives them peace of mind to know that when their paycheck cannot stretch and meet their needs, that we will cover a charge to help them to buy gas or put food on their table. Uh, to participate in an overdraft program is a choice. It is one that our may members make understanding what it is and how it works. We at our credit union make sure that we educate our members on overdraft protection and teach them how to use it responsibly. We disclose everything to our members up front and it is not a rush program and none of my members will tell you that they were forced to participate in such a program. Now as a $100 million credit union, I recognize that I am exempt from the rules of the CFPB. However, there will be a trickle down effect because if larger institutions are forced to lower or cut their fees, my members will expect me to do the same. And a reduction in fees would mean a reduction in the services that I am able to provide. The final rule on credit card late fees also are for larger institutions. However, similar to overdraft courtesy pay programs, it will have a negative impact on my in institution, regardless of the fact that I'm exempt. The $8 fee is not enough to cover the cost of collecting on a credit card once that credit card becomes delinquent. Um, again, those fees are fully disclosed to our members prior to them uh, receiving their credit card and at the time of application. $8, an $8 fee is not enough to encourage responsible uh, behaviors from our members. If they have a choice to pay an $8 late fee versus a higher late fee charged by someone else, they will not pay our card and cover the bill that has the higher late fee penalty. 
I would also argue that government agencies and entities charge a late fee that is much higher than $8. So the biggest concern for us is safety and soundness. As Senator Brown pointed out, if our members become late, it's reported on their credit bureau as such. It demises their ability to get credit in the future and it will also cause financial institutions to tighten up on their credit standards. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that I hope you understand that these regulations poses a su substantial risk to small credit unions like mine, as well as to my members and the communities that we serve. I am asking Congress and regulators to take action and do something to stop this before it's too late. Thank you for inviting me here to, to be a witness today and testify and speak on this issue. And I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Madry from my neighboring state of Indiana. Uh, Mr. Swero, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Uh, thank you to the committee staff for inviting me to be here today. I am Santiago Suero, Senior Policy Analyst at Unidos US. We're the largest Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization in the country. We partner with 300 affiliates from Ohio to South Carolina to Texas and Florida. Our affiliates are community organizations that serve Latinos. Working class people, people of color, and Latinos are experiencing mixed results in our economy. The good news is that unemployment is at near historic lows and real wages are rising even as inflation keeps declining. On the other hand, too many families continue to face economic difficulties. Poverty, for instance, remains higher than pre-pandemic levels, and skyrocketing housing costs are burdening families. Wealth inequality also remains a concern as researchers calculate that fully closing the racial wealth gap for Latinos could take up to 228 years at the current pace. Developments in the financial system mirror this mixed economic picture. Fees and costs are falling, including for overdraft fees and small dollar loans and the number of people who remain unbanked is reaching near historic lows. However, many challenges remain. Credit card debt is at the highest level ever, and working class consumers are paying more in late fees than wealthier consumers. Industry progress towards reducing, reducing overdraft fees also appears to have stalled, and the most recent studies suggest that the number of people without a bank account is rising. Backsliding on these means that more households will fall into economic hardship or deeper distress. Efforts to reduce these fees can have a major impact on the financial well-being of working class consumers. The CFPB's credit card late fees rule, for example, is projected to save consumers more than $10 billion. There are three major reasons why supporting this rule and others like it are important to making the financial system more equitable. First, fees are all too common among working class consumers and people of color. Those in the poorest neighborhoods pay twice as much in total late fees than do those in the wealthy areas. A new forthcoming survey by Unidos US finds that one in four Latinos uh, have made a credit card late fee in the past year. Second, fees harm financial health and access to credit, making it harder to get an account out of delinquency and increasing the chances of losing an account. In fact, a large percentage of consumers identify late fees as a barrier to obtaining credit. Third, late fees do not effectively deter late payment and undermine the lender's relationship with borrowers. Evidence shows that most people who miss a bill payment simply cannot pay because they don't have the funds. Many who are charged a late fee may be facing a decision between paying their rent or paying their credit card bill. The decision there is clear. High late fees are thus counterproductive because they pile onto existing debt. Congress and financial institutions should build upon progress from the past few years by following three principles. First, policymakers should respect efforts by financial regulators to improve affordability in the marketplace while supporting innovations to better meet the needs of working class people. Bank on certified accounts are an example of a market solution that improves inclusion while maintaining safeguards to prevent abusive practices. Others are also developing affordable small dollar loans and credit card products that save consumers money and improve their finances. Second, financial institutions should reimagine the relationship between themselves and consumers to promote long-term customer loyalty and financial health. Consumers notice when a financial institution is willing to be flexible with them 
and they will in turn remain loyal to the financial institution as they grow economically and need other financial products. Third, democratic structures can make our banking system more equitable. Credit unions, especially CDFIs and MDIs, are examples of community-owned banks that democratize banking policy decisions. Policymakers should cultivate these to reach more people. Finally, policies that require banks to meet with communities will allow their needs to be voiced where it counts. Ultimately, investing in working class people by providing affordable and high quality products will allow banks and communities to grow together. If we create a banking system built on trust and loyalty, one that invests in the long term potential of everyone, we will be a major step closer to creating a more fair, inclusive, and thriving economy. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mr. Ross. Start with Mr. Rust. Uh, working families have real budgets. Um, they have to stick to junk fees, do not allow them uh, to know the true cost of a product, making consumers pay more than what they're budgeted for. Last week, CFPB released a report finding that consumers pay more for products with, shall we say, complex pricing structures. Mr. Russ, what are some, a couple questions, what are some of the most troubling junk fees you've seen in financial services and in rental housing, and how do these hidden fees affect people's ability to find the lowest price and stifle healthy competition between businesses? Thank you for your question. I think the, the point of complexity cannot be overstated. This, this is an issue where it becomes difficult to comparison shop because you don't know all of the costs ahead of time. I do find it stunning to see leases where there are scores of fees added on top of the original rent. That makes it um, that people could actually apply for an apartment, think it's affordable, receive an invitation uh, to, to move in, and then discover that, in fact, it was too expensive. Uh, credit card late fees, that's $14.5 billion a year. Overdraft fees, similar. Uh, and then just the myriad of fees that people pay at any point in time when they're having a struggle. I think you see this with uh, captive arrangements. I listed about 10 kinds of fees that are also involved, but there are more. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Um, and I uh, appreciate your comments about your complexity. I appreciate Ms. Madry's uh, the way she runs her credit union, and credit unions overwhelmingly in Ohio, I see the same way. They they explain their members, they explain to their members better. They keep a simple structure. Um, they really aren't the problem. So I just wanted to say that in response to her testimony, uh, Mr. Swero, I want to get some facts straight about CFPB's credit card late fee rule. Um, please answer the following, uh, I guess, four questions with a yes or no. According to the law, credit card late fees are not meant to generate profits. Yet, on average, they generate profits that are five times greater than relevant costs. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Do credit card late fees disproportionately impact consumers with lower credit scores and people in less well-off neighborhoods? Yes. And you, you made that clear in your testimony. Thanks for repeating it. Are only the largest credit card issuers covered by the CFPB rule? Uh, yes, with one million, you have to have one million open accounts. And that's the reason for Ms. Madry's credit union, as most credit unions in Ohio would be exempted. Uh, so the rule just doesn't apply to small, 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 card, uh, small card issuers, correct? Correct, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, credit card issuers shouldn't be extracting profits from consumers through late fees, first of all, because it's unfair to consumers, second of all, because these rules are required to be reasonable and proportional to cost. By reducing late fees, it's pretty clear CFPB is ensuring consumers save over $10 billion every year. Uh, back to you, Mr. Rust. Um, on rental junk fees, which is every bit as problematic as, as financial services junk fees. In rental housing, they're raising already far too high housing costs. Companies charge renters all kinds of fees, application fees, processing fees, convenience fees, notice fees. Uh, and I'm sure you could cite several others. Some renters report even being charged a January fee, a fee for just being in the month of January, unbelievably perhaps. Uh, Mr. Russ, can you explain the types of fees that renters face, the challenges these fees create for renters uh, shopping for a place they can afford or manage their expenses once they sign their lease? So thank you. And to be honest, I can't explain the fees. I, they seem unexplainable, right? 
Um, but the truth is, is that I think it reflects a power imbalance. And I would say that if we had more housing supply, perhaps landlords wouldn't be attempting to extract these kinds of fees from consumers. But in the moment when there is this vulnerability, they are. Uh, I, I think the point about comparison shopping, just it is so hard to determine how much you're really going to pay. That doesn't make any sense at all for our economy. Um, Okay, and again, that, that speaks to us, what Ms. Madry said, that you can comparison shop with her because they make it clear, they're simple, they, they, I mean, they're exempt from this rule, I'll point that out, as she acknowledged, but it's made, it makes it that much more complex uh, in the larger institutions that really are the ones that extract, the, the, that levy the biggest fees and the most, the most frequent fees and are the most onerous to moderate income people and to, to everybody. Mr. Swaver, Swaver you want to um, add anything on, on to what Mr. Russ said? Yeah, you know, uh, pointing out that there's sometimes in this similar to the rental housing market and housing in general, in banking, a lot of people are finding themselves without a lot of options. And so the same uh, dynamic applies here where if you, you need an account or you need a loan or you need a credit card, but you only have one or two options to choose from, you're gonna have trouble, um, you know, you're gonna pay what they're, what they're gonna offer because you need that account. So it makes it more difficult to comparison shop and it makes it easier for the financial institution to, to raise costs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So much has been said, so I'd love to debate, but it, I only have five minutes. So, so unfortunate, Good. but uh, let me just ask you a question, Ms. Madry. Uh, reading your story about who you are and the success that you've had being the CEO of a credit union, uh, you have overcome real obstacles. You, uh, I wish we had more time for you to tell your story because honestly, the question that I want to ask deserves the context of not just your position today, but the journey that you've taken to get to your position today. Uh, I, I think about my life story and the challenges I've had to overcome from a single parent household mired in poverty and what that really means for the context in which I'm asking the questions. I think about some of my staffers, Catherine Fuchs, who's last day in the committees today. Uh, I think about her growing up on a farm, a farm that focuses on vegetables, the cucumbers, and corn, and, and the impact that that has on her psyche and the ability to work hard. And I think about the three stories that we have combined together, and I, and I ask myself if the CFPB is gonna save the average person about $200 a year, or the cost of the Biden economy on a family of four, $15,000 a year. When you are in your credit union in Indiana and your members come in and they're complaining about the cost of gas, cost of food, the cost of energy, do you, do you hear them talking more about the challenges, the $15,000, the weight of Bidenomics, or do you hear them talking a little bit more about the late fee? That's a great question. Every day we have members come into our credit union and express just how hard it is to make ends meet. One of the things about our credit union is that we do not take a fast food approach to lending. My lenders will spend anywhere from an hour to two hours with a member because we wanna listen and understand the struggles that they're facing. We will do what we can to help them to overcome those challenges, and we do it with empathy. Um, my, my lenders have training on how to envision themselves walking in our members' shoes. We help them to look at their financial situation and create budgets, and when it's deemed necessary, we provide them with a loan if that is in their best interest. We do a lot of debt consolidation loans to try to help put them in a better financial position. So because we're regulated, because we are limited and capped at an 18% interest rate, quite often my members can borrow money from me at a much more affordable rate. When we consolidate all of their debt and give them one payment to make, it makes it easier for them to manage their finances. It makes them less prone to late fees. The other thing that we do is when a member comes in and says, I'm having a hardship, 
we do a lot of extensions on loans where we will forgive payments for up to 90 days. If they are having problems paying their current loans, we will do modifications. We will look at what they can reasonably afford to pay and rewrite that loan at that loan payment so that our members can be successful. As you said, I have lived that life. I wish when I was struggling that there was a bank or a financial institution that was willing to help me better manage my money so that I could ensure that my children always had food on their tables. That was not always the case. And so I am committed to making sure the people in the communities that I serve have a wonderful opportunity and know that we are there to walk alongside them and help them through whatever financial challenge they face. Thank you. We need more people like you in the financial services industry without any question. Uh, you have introduced financial laws 101, fast food approach. You don't take the fast food approach. I love that concept. Uh, because I'm only the ranking member and not the chairman, he's going to cut me off in a few minutes because I'm going to run out of time. But uh, I want to talk for just a quick about something I call the law of the trade-offs. There are no changes to fee structures that doesn't require a trade-off. So if your fees go away, either your interest rates go up, the cost of the product goes up, or the product itself goes away. Yay, nay? I agree with that, and we have looked at what we would do if the overdraft protection law was passed into regulation. It would mean that we would have to cut our services. It could mean that we would uh, have to lay off staff. I currently employ 36 people in my community, and we would have to move away from this two-hour approach and say, how can we accomplish things in a shorter period of time? Thank you very much. I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I'll just close with this. I know the Chairman is trying to do his best to be as lenient with me as possible. It's a difficult challenge. It is indeed. And I appreciate his transparency there. Let me just suggest this, that even though the fees that we're talking about do not apply to your credit union, you said without any question that the trickle-down effect will have impact on your credit union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your Thank you, Senator this Scott. Morning. Don't try it again next week. <laughs> I tried not to do it last Senator week. Chester of Montana is recognized. That's what happens when you run for president. It gets a little longer on the questions and answers, right? I told Brown that, too. He's gotten really long-winded since he ran for president. Yes, sir, I agree with <laughs> I you. Did not, I did not run for president, <laughs> Mr. Scott. <laughs> All right, anything I can do to start some fights, that's good. Hey, look. Um, Housing is a big issue across this country, and uh, Montana has had a housing shortage for years. That's my home state. It's getting worse. Ever go wherever you go across the state, uh, one of the first challenge folks mentioned to me is lack of workforce housing in our state. It's really hurting our economy, quite frankly. Um, and we're seeing a lot of wealthy individuals and groups come into the last best place, which is what they call Montana, and buying up these houses. It's happening with single-family homes, uh, buildings. We've seen examples of it happening with manufactured home communities where Montanans are really stuck. They own a mobile home that really isn't mobile at all, and they t these out-of-state investors take advantage by jacking up the rent and jacking up fees on, on hard-working Montanans and seniors that are living in sometimes the only affordable stuff left in the state. On top of jacking up rent, uh, they often, uh, these out-of-state investors often add new fees, uh, basic fees. They've always been included. But now all of a sudden they're not. Fees, sewer and water are two. The chairman talked about others. And that have been long included as part of the rent, okay? Uh, and so what we're seeing is a lot of out-of-staters are making money off what used to be affordable housing and making it not so affordable anymore. So Mr. Rust... Uh, just give me some insight on how uh, any additional fees, how increase in fees, how new fees impact folks uh, across the board, but specifically in, in these manufactured home parks where they really don't have a lot of flexibility and they don't have a lot of money. Thank you for that question. That is such an important thing to remember. 
From 2015 to 2018, uh, a group of private equity investors bought over 150,000 lots. Again, this is a power imbalance. When a person lives in a manufactured housing community, it's very difficult to move. It, it might cost five to $10,000 to move. If you can afford that, then it's also difficult to find a place that will take a used manufacturing, manufactured home because there are fewer and fewer, fewer communities that are zoning for these communities. It's true, as you said, that the cost is going up, not just the rent, but also fees are being added onto it. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, this is workforce housing, right? It is working in rural communities where there are fewer construction crews available. It's housing for seniors. This is a fundamental uh, aspect of something that's happening in the Midwest and the upper Midwest. Um, and, and junk fees, it's just not fair. So, so the real question is, is I think we can all agree it's not fair. This is workforce housing. This is senior housing. These are folks that are, they're working hard for their money. Some of them are on fixed incomes. And, uh, and so the question is, what does Congress do about it? Well, so I'm glad you raised that. There, there is a bill before Congress that would permit uh, investment in manufactured housing communities, in particular when resident-owned communities seek to buy homes or nonprofit groups, the challenge they face is that it's very difficult to gather the capital in a short period of time. And typically the reason a, a manufactured housing community is being sold is because there's an infrastructure challenge. So it becomes very expensive to find the capital and buy a home quickly. The Price Act, which is a bipartisan supported act, will provide grant funding uh, to address these issues and I believe will become a, a very important source of reinvestment in communities. So let me go back to something you just said, because I want to clarify that a little bit. Did you say that they're being sold because of um, uh, infrastructure needs? Or I just want to clarify this for me. I see them being sold because in our particular case, we got out-of-staters are coming into the state that want to change our state, and they see an opportunity to make a quick buck on the back of working people and seniors, and that's exactly what they do. Well, right, the cash flows available on manufactured housing communities, especially if you're talking about owning the land but not the units, are, are very certain, they're very guaranteed. There are consultancies out there saying, yes, these individuals will have a hard time moving. This is an opportunity for you to make a lot of money. I uh, appreciate all three of your testimony. I appreciate what you guys are doing. I had a question for the credit union lady, but I'm out of time. And unlike the ranking member, I do not want to go over. I yield. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Tess. Senator Vance of Ohio is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to you and the ranking member. Um, I think it's important just to sort of note that this entire conversation about late fees, overdraft fees, and so forth uh, takes place in the context of extraordinarily high interest rates. I'm 39 years old. It's so, uh, pretty much the worst interest rate environment um, since I was, I, was, I was a toddler. And I mercifully don't remember anything about interest rates when I was three years old. So. Uh, I, I, I think we have to sort of be careful here about this particular proposal, or at the very least appreciate some of its implications. And, and Mr. Uh, Ms. Madry, I, I wanted to sort of direct this first question with you. You obviously run a small bank, and I appreciate you being here. Um, or I should say small credit union, right? Right. Um, I, 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 maybe you could just sort of explain how, especially in the context of higher interest rates, what this particular proposal would mean for your ability uh, to offer debt and credit services to, to sort of people, especially low-income people? So in the context of my credit union, first off, we're capped at 18% interest rates. Yeah. And it, we really um, try very hard to keep our interest rates very low. I'm in a market where um, there, it is overbanked, and underserved, and so I have extreme market pressures to have low rates in order to attract borrowers. And we also, as a credit union, we believe in giving profits back to our members. Sure. So liquidity is tight, so I am paying higher rates on my members' deposits because we, as a credit union, I am reliant upon the deposits that my members make to provide the liquidity that I need to lend out. So 
while the interest rates have climbed, my members have not felt much of that pinch. Again, I serve a low income population and it is important to me to make sure that uh, financial services are affordable to my members. The fee income really helps to offset the operating costs that goes along with collecting on overdraft when a member overdraft draws their account. We have to send out letters. My staff is there calling members. Um, it helps when members are coming in because their account is overdrawn because of a circumstance or a life event. As I said, my staff will uh, take the time to talk to the member, understand the situation, and help them to find a solution. I can tell you that the way we operate in our credit union is if a member's account is overdrawn, we will do everything that we can to help them to get back in good standing. We waive fees whenever possible if a member comes in and asks. We have uh, other alternatives that we make available to members. However, when you're serving a population that is vulnerable, quite often they don't want loan products. They feel more comfortable with this service because it prevents them propelling into perpetual sure, debt. Sure, So I appreciate that, Ms. Madarina. I want to pick up on that, that, that basic point, um, Mr. Rust. And I know you're an advocate of this proposal. And I, I want to just understand this, this basic question. I mean, do you think that consumers, especially lower-income consumers, will have a lot less access to credit if this proposal becomes law, the junk fee proposal? And do you mean specifically the credit card late fee rule? Yes. So thank you for the question. I personally think that credit cards are among the most profitable sources of business for institutions. And the Y14 data from the Federal Reserve talks about returns on assets that are three to four times greater than other forms of commercial banking. There's examples of institutions with profit margins of over 40% on their credit card business. So in my view, this is an, a question of will credit cards be exorbitantly profitable or just incredibly profitable? So I, I understand that, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with the underlying argument, Mr. Russ. I, I guess my point is, look, when you take a product that's, even if I assume sort of your framing is correct and say it's very profitable to sort of moderately profitable, if you make something more expensive, if you take it from very profitable to just you know somewhat profitable, don't you fundamentally make it less likely that people are going to offer those services? And I, my, my point here is not to put you in a, in a tough spot. I, I guess my argument is, is I think it would be better for, if we were just honest about the debate we were actually having. Uh, this proposal will inevitably lead to less credit options for lower income people. And I wish its advocates would just lean into that and say, yeah, that's exactly what it's going to do. In fact, we think that's a good thing as opposed to sort of hiding from the fact that it will mean less consumer credit for low-income people. And I guess a related point is, if, if the goal here is to provide options uh, and to reduce the debt spiral that we all know people in low-income situations sometimes experience, I, I maybe wish we just tried to deal with that problem directly as opposed to the sort of backdoor way of making credit more expensive and consequently less available to people. So I, I just wish this whole debate was a little bit more honest about what we're really doing. What we're proposing to do is to make consumer debt much less available to low-income people. Let's just be honest about that and then have the debate about whether that's good or bad or could be accomplished through other means. That's that's sort of my, my point here. With that, Senator Mr. Chairman, Menendez, I'll stop. Senator, Thank you. Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ample research shows uh, that junk fees are disproportionately targeted at and paid by minority consumers. To give one example, according to a survey from Bankrate, Hispanic checking account holders pay an average of more than triple that of white account holders. Mr. Suedo, uh, can you talk about the particular vulnerability of minority consumers to junk fees? Yeah, so uh, on uh, first point is low income people and working class people across the board pay more in overdraft fees and credit card late fees. Latinos and black uh, consumers pay even higher uh, rates of overdraft fees and junk fees. We just did a survey 
um, where we found that 40% of all Latinos had paid a junk fee. This is much higher than other groups. 25% of Latinos had paid a credit card late fee, which is much, also much higher than other groups. So it's, it's widespread. It's disproportionately affecting people who don't have a lot of income. No. And then one of, one of the other elements of it is I'm concerned that disparities are even larger for the 26 million Americans who have limited English proficiency. Um, these consumers are disproportionately targeted by scams. They often face difficulty accessing consumer protection resources and education materials. Uh, what can we do to promote price transparency and reduce the disproportionate fees paid by minority and LEP consumers? There's a number of different things. Number one is, you know, for LEP consumers in particular, we need to make sure that our marketing and our um, the materials that we offer consumers are transparent, are accurate, and are in Spanish and other uh, languages spoken in the U.S. as well. Um, we found in the auto uh, lending space that there's been a lot of issues with auto lenders uh, promoting a product in Spanish at a certain price. And then when the consumer comes in to get that loan, it turns out the price was different. The interest rate was higher. There were other fees associated. The FTC has done a lot of work uh, trying to address that issue. So that's one. The second part is on a broader scale, obviously these rules we think will help. That's why we support them. In, in the market, we can also promote things like bank on accounts. We can also promote things like affordable small dollar loans that have low interest rates. Um, credit cards that lots of credit card products that are out there that are really solid have low interest rates, have no or low late fees. We need to be promoting those products as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russ, in May of 22, the CFA and several other consumer groups sent a letter to the CFPB on junk fees in financial services. In that letter, you stated, and I quote, junk fees contribute to high rates of unbanked or underbanked households of color, close quote. Can you and Mr. Suedo elaborate on how junk fees drive low-income families away from the traditional financing system and how this negatively impacts their financial well-being? So thank you for that question. The FDIC does research every two years on the unbanked and the underbanked, and they, they ask, why don't you have a bank account? And the, the first reason is, I'm afraid of having a bank account because of surprise fees. And the third reason specifically calls out overdraft fees. So this, these set of fees are explicitly creating financial exclusion. I, I would add, uh, we see similar um, findings with credit cards. There's surveys out there asking consumers, why don't you have a credit card if you don't have a credit card? They cite costs, interest rates, and late fees specifically as one of the reasons why they don't get those. I would add, you know, people that do have uh, these high cost products are often more likely to, um, for credit cards being delinquent, um, for overdraft fees to, uh, to lose their products, get overburdened in debt in both situations, and can get pushed out of the uh, financial system if they're not uh, able to pay those fees. Yeah. According to a 2019 FDIC survey, 16% of unbanked households cited distrust of banks as the main reason for not having an account. It's something we, we have to uh, try to modify because we need people to enter uh, a portal of financial institutions so that this way they're not going to the check cashing place and the payday lender um, and the pawnbroker. One final question. Uh, one area where renters are feeling uh, acutely the pain of junk fees is the search for housing in New Jersey where housing is acute. Uh, it can be difficult, particularly for low-income families, and it seems that many landlords are taking advantage of that fact by charging exorbitant applications fees, as high as $350 in some instances, according to the National Consumer Law Center. Mr. Russ, are these application fees truly reflective of actual costs uh, incurred by the landlord in processing applications? So, uh, no, they're not. Thank you for that question. Uh, TransUnion, for example, has a service that they market to landlords where between, the cost is between $25 and $42 based on what, what basket of services the landlord wants. Uh, and then, yes, turn that around and charge $100 per person, even more. That's, that's what's happening, and that makes it very difficult to comparison shop because just the search costs are so high. It makes people say, I, I have to apply for this first one and just take it because I can't afford another $300 application fee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Senator Brett, Alabama's recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Americans are facing real problems and real financial challenges under the Biden administration. Yet I am discouraged by the continual lack of responsibility taken by this White House for the consequences of its own actions. What we see from this administration is another attempt to change its messaging, to blame shift rather than reversing course or admitting fault. According to some of my colleagues um, on the other side of the aisle, it's not inflation or excessive government spending or overregulation that is fueling the obstacles that hardworking families are facing just to make ends meet every day. Instead, they are pointing the blame to everyone imaginable. Last week in this committee room, we uh, talked about shrinkflation. This week, it's junk fees that are to blame. Junk fees, by the way, is an arbitrary term found nowhere in any legal statute used by this administration to vilify seemingly every industry that offers services to its customers. However, so many times, these are just political talking points used to distract from the root of the problem and to evade accountability. There is also an attempt to justify significant regulatory actions from regulators across the board. And without any adequate cost-benefit analysis to follow or any assessment of how these numerous rulemakings actually impact the end user, actually impact the customer, or actually impact the member. These very individuals that these regulators uh, and administration claim to be, quote, helping, I believe are the very ones that are going to suffer the most. Mrs. Madre, just to clarify, and you obviously are the CEO of a smaller financial institution, Afina Credit, Federal Credit Union, and I want to know how this is going to affect your members, what this means to the very people that we are trying to help. So first, does current regulation already require credit unions and banks to disclose fees to their members and to their customers? So the current regulation is requires us to disclose fees. Yes, okay. we have a fee schedule that we go over with our members at the time that they apply for okay, it. Okay, thank you. And in addition to these disclosures that are already required by law, uh, do your institutions typically engage in other forms of communication with your members or your customers? Do you, do you for instance, share things like low balance alerts, things like that? Yes, we have texting services that we that our members can opt into that will alert them when their balance is low, plus all sorts of tools where they can monitor their account online. Okay, well, thank you. In addition to these types of alerts and communications, um, have financial institutions, particularly the smaller credit unions, proactively made other changes to their late fees and overdraft fee programs without any additional regulation or legislative changes? Like, what have you done um, to make uh, improvements in this area? So one of the things that we do is our members who have overdraft protection, we educate them that you do not have to access that by swiping your debit card. Mm -hmm. If you find that you cannot make ends meet, we encourage our members to come in and ask that all of the funds that are available be moved into their checking account or savings account so that they pay just the one fee in the course of a month and they will have those funds available to them when they need them. Excellent. I am I am glad to hear that. I certainly believe you understand the needs of your members and the day-to-day -day challenges that they face um, in the state of Indiana more than anyone in a regulating building here in Washington, D.C. So I appreciate what you are doing um, to help the very people that these regulations um, intend uh, or say they intend to help. A couple of other questions. Do, do you as the CEO determine your salary or your bonus based on overdraft or late fee charges? Charges at your credit union? No. Uh -huh. And in fact, That's what I thought. In I, fact, go ahead. I will just share that from time to time, I have told my board that I will forego a raise or a bonus when I feel that our credit union needs to show a profit in order to be able to meet regulatory requirements. And obviously serve your members' needs. So thank you so much. And can you share with us what you anticipate will happen to the products that you offer to your members at your credit union if the CFPB so-called junk fee rules are finalized as proposed? I mean, specifically, what would happen to things like free checking account or affordable small business loans? And 
that, that's kind of what I want to know. Yes, we would probably have to rethink our uh, interest rate structure, increase our interest rates when possible, eliminate things like free checking accounts. And eliminate free checking accounts. Eliminate free checking. The very thing, the very people that um, this rule is so-called so intended to help, I believe it will hurt, and I think that what you have said um, proves that right there. So thank you so much, and I wish we could take a look at these regulations and actually see how they affect the, the end user. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Smith of Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Chair Brown. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. I really appreciate it. It's a very important topic. Um, I'm going to focus my questions first with, um, with you, Mr. Rust. I want to talk a bit about these automated tenant screening processes that are popping up all over the place. So landlords are increasingly turning to automatic screening tools um, and reports to determine whether or not to rent to a prospective tenant. And so who pays for these screenings? It's usually, it's of course, it's the applicants. And in Minnesota, um, a two adult family is at paying on average four application fees, um, incurring about $320 in total costs every time they're trying to find a place to live. Um, and I've heard reports that that number could go up to um, $800. So obviously, these screening fees are making it really expensive for families, especially low-income families, to find an affordable place to live. Um, and they might not even result in a fair or accurate assessment of the capacity of that tenant to be able to be a good tenant. One woman in Minnesota, for example, was denied an apartment because a, a tenant screening report flagged an incorrect criminal record. And this isn't an anomaly. An investigation of, tenant, of the tenant screening industry by the CFPB found that screening services can use incorrect information and often provide limited explanation back to folks about why they've been denied, leaving runners in the dark and in the hole financially. So they paid for an inaccurate um, screening. So could you talk a bit about this? Tell us um, your perspective on how this is working, the obstacles that they create for tenants, and what we should be doing to protect people against these tools. Thank you for that question. You've raised something really important, which is how the evolution of tenants, tenant screening reports are changing. They're becoming more complex, and one of the issues that then le that happens from that is that it's very difficult if there's information on your report that's not true. Well, first off, it's very hard to even know if that's the case. It's harder, perhaps, to even know how to re re fix it. So this is happening frequently, and again, when the information is wrong, and then you're denied, well, that's $100, that's $200, and you've got to try again. And if the information is wrong on Tuesday, it's probably wrong on Thursday. Right, right. And I mean, that's, um, do you have, I mean, I mean it, it, I'm, I'm kind of stuttering because I think that this is just so unfair that you actually are being forced to pay for something that is inaccurately and unfairly denying you um, a place to live. And I mean, wouldn't that go, I mean, consumers should have a right to know whether they're being denied um, a rent based on inaccurate information. That's part of what's in fair lending laws, right? Right, the FTC has been working on this as well as the CFPB with complaint, <clears throat> filing complaints against institutions that don't have record systems in place to make sure that information is correct. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Mr. Um, Suero, am I saying your name correctly? Yeah. Thank you. I want to just follow up a bit on the question that Senator Britt and others have been asking about. Um, you know, I think that consumers understand that the prices of products and services in this world have a markup, I and mean, that's capitalism. They get that. But I think if you told them that they were um, looking at a markup that was like 400 um, percent, that maybe they would think twice about what's going on and what is really fair and reasonable. And I mean, to me, that is really the issue that is at the core of the CFPB's um, credit card late fee rule. Um, and so my question to you is, this is adding up to you know billions of dollars that is being costing people for these late fees. And there seems to be sort of this argument that um, credit card issuers are suggesting that these high fees are basically an incentive to get people to pay their bills on time. But that is assuming that people could pay their bills on time and aren't because they just don't feel like it, as opposed to what seems to be more likely, which is that they can't. Um, and so, um, it, could you, I'd like to hear your comments on this. And uh, to me, this sort of gets at the issue of why it is so expensive to be poor mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah, so there are a number of different pieces here. Number one is we know from lots of surveys and we know from just talking to people 
that a lot of one of the biggest reasons why people don't pay is simply they don't have the funds, right? right? And we know, you know, we also see this reflected in the data. It's lower income people that are living paycheck to paycheck that are disproportionately paying these fees. So folks are in a situation where they are faced with a decision between putting food on the table or paying this late fee. That's one. Two is the CFPB collected a lot of comments, 57,000 comments. They received a ton of comments um, from consumers who had been paying late fees. One of the comments, um, so just to give you like a real world example, one of the uh, people that commented was um, uh, a parent. They had a se very serious medical issue. They were paying lots of uh, for expensive uh, medicine, and they were working two and three jobs. Mm -hmm. Three, you know, a third job every now and again just to make ends meet. They missed the payment because they had worked so late that they worked after midnight of the. Uh, uh, day that the payment was due and they missed the payment window they got charged with a $35 late fee. Mm -hmm. So this is the type of thing that is also an example of where this is a working class person they had the funds but they couldn't do it but there's so many other things going on in people's lives that they couldn't pay it. There were other examples like people put their payment in the mail. Yeah. The mail uh, the money didn't get to the credit card company in time because the mail not slowed down. Not their fault and they're not going to pay quicker in any of those circumstances because they're you know um, I, Mr. Chair, I know I'm out of time. I thank you for the opportunity to ask these questions, and thanks to our panelists. Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto from Nevada is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, I, I know uh, one of my colleagues already talked about manufactured housing. I'm going to touch on this because we don't talk about manufactured housing enough and the potential uh, for it. Um, I know Mr. Rust, thank you very much. Um, wrote uh, an incredible book here, um, and I very thoughtful about families who live in manufactured housing. To my colleagues, this was in 2007. If you haven't had a chance to read it, please do. A few months ago, um, HUD announced a request for applications for a new program. I think you've talked about this to fund new roads, water, sewer, tornado shelters, and other infrastructure improvements. It's the, called the Price um, Program in honor of Congressman David Price, who, by the way, wrote the foreword here. Uh, in, in the book, um, and I led the bill uh, uh, for um, the Preservation and Reinvestment Initiative for Community Enhancement, the permanent program. And, and why is this? Because I see the benefits in my state, but Mr. Russ, can you explain why the 8.5 million Americans who live in manufactured home communities deserve special consideration and investment? So thank you for that question. I, I've visited manufactured housing communities in Nevada and th this is clearly an issue there, the cost of, of rehabilitating a community, the cost of infrastructure investment. This is something that the Price Act will address. And I, I think it's, it's strongly needed. Um, so why are, are people living in manufactured housing? What are the reasons for that demand that exists? It's because it's, it's affordable. Um, it, it meets the needs of people who are seniors, it meets the needs of workers who may be working in a community where there's not uh, a large set of construction workers, so rural areas. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. community, manufactured housing communities can be a very nice place to live. They are communities, right? But if they're being disinvested in, and I would say if you go around to, a, to your local neighborhood and look for the neighborhood that is the least that is, that is receiving the least amount of capital, it's probably a manufactured housing community. That's right, and that's the, that's the unfortunate piece about this, because there also is some stigma associated with uh, a manufactured housing, which there shouldn't be. This is an opportunity for so many people to have a roof over the head and have, a, and have it be affordable. I also, I know one of my colleagues talked about private equity coming in and purchasing up a lot of these. I have concerns about that. We see that just in housing in general in Southern Nevada, and it is an issue that we need to address um, these high costs. Um, Mr. Russ, let me ask you this. In Nevada, 86% of extremely low income renters are severely housing <laughs> cost burden, meaning renters that are spending more than 50% of their income on rent. Uh, and rents are only going up. Since 2020, rents have increased between 20 and 30% in some parts of my state. As families are forced to spend more and more on rent, they're left with fewer resources, we know that. Uh, how do additional fees imposed on renters like application fees, processing fees, and, and so-called convenience fees exacerbate these high costs of rent? So that, that's, that's a great question. 
I think it gets down to if you're going to comparison shop, if you're going to look on a platform and you see 10 different potential places to live, and some of those listings are all in price and some are partitioned where there might be fees that you don't even know about, well, that makes it very difficult to comparison shop. It puts well-intentioned landlords who are being fair at a disadvantage with landlords that are playing these games. So, uh, yes, and, and I, think, I think what we're seeing are cases where consumers are paying rent on time in their community, in their manufactured housing community. Private equity comes in, they buy the park, they add $400 in fees, and suddenly it becomes groceries or paying the rent, or even if I have to leave, I may not be able to take my home with me, so I may actually lose that home. That's right. That's right. And nobody should have to make that decision, but unfortunately there are too many, um, just even uh, individuals that are having, I don't care whether you're a veteran, you're a senior, you're working, hardworking family, um, you're still, there's many in, in our communities now that are having to make this decision, and that's why we, we have to address it. More, more importantly, we have to address these fees and these junk fees that are add-ons. We've got to address the housing issue and the affordability of housing, and that's why I'm so pleased there's bipartisan support mm -hmm. in this committee to really address these issues. And I hope, I hope we are able to pass this for the benefit of so many, not just in Nevada, but across the country. There's more questions that I have. I'm not going to be able to get to everyone. I thank you for being here and your commitment to addressing these issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Cortez Master. Senator Warren of Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in 2009, Congress passed the CARD Act to crack down on banks and other credit card issuers that were abusing consumers with excessive late fees and bait and switch terms, like those low initial rates that once somebody signed on the dotted line really jumped up and jumped up high. The CARD Act slashed average late fees by a third to $23 in 2010. But by 2022, 12 years later, by exploiting loopholes in the law, that number was back up to $32 enough to make the biggest credit card companies an extra $14.5 billion in profits that year. Meanwhile, average credit card APRs have nearly doubled over the last decade from 13% in 2013 to 23% in 2023. That is the highest on record. Now, as credit card companies have grown their profits through interest and fees, they have also become more concentrated, with the biggest issuers gobbling up the smaller ones. In 2022, the 10 biggest credit card companies in the country accounted for 83% of all credit card loans. Mr. Rust, you have studied the credit card market for years now. Can you say something about how the smaller credit card issuers stack up versus the biggest issuers in terms of how much they're charging consumers, the big guys versus the, the small guys that are still left? Thank you for that question. And actually, I was really hoping to have the opportunity to say that CFA and the CFPB have pointed out that interest rates at smaller institutions, small credit unions are lower, right? And this has to do, I believe, with the fact that the credit card market is somewhat broken because the way that people are comparison shopping, when they say, I would like to get a credit card, it doesn't take them to the small bank. It takes them through a comparison shopping site, a lead generator that's earning large amounts of fees to direct them just to the cards that have the highest rates. And we're seeing margin on margin issues where the amount of the margin is growing over time. It's never been higher. And credit card issuers that are larger are charging interest rates that are 8 to, 7, eight to 10 percentage points higher now. Wow. So... The big guys with the highest paid CEOs are actually charging consumers a whole lot more than the little guys in the credit card market. And it's the big guys who are hitting particularly hard on customers' pockets. Mr. Suero, you're an expert on predatory lending practices. Who's paying the bulk of the interest and fees that are driving credit card companies' profits? Yeah, so there's there's a number of different ways to look at it. CFPB has found that uh, consumers with deep 
subprime, um, uh, subprime credit scores are paying a disproportionately high amount of fees. We know that that population are generally lower income, working class people of color. Um, we know from our surveys, we know from other consumer surveys, you know, this has been reflected over time repeatedly that um, low income people disproportionately pay these, Latinos, black consumers also are disproportionately paying these fees. Okay, so people are paying more and you know who is paying more, people who are struggling the most. Now the CFPB is taking action to rein in price gouging in the credit card market, including by capping most late fees at $8. Obviously, very good news for American families. Of course, we know who's not happy about that, big credit card issuers and their Republican friends in Congress. Last month, Republicans introduced a bill to overturn the CFPB's credit card late fee rule so that the credit card industry can continue squeezing every last dime out of these consumers. One House Republican even said, quote, the vast majority of Americans support these fees. So Mr. Rust, I have to ask, do you know anyone who is actually a consumer who loves junk fees? So I have never heard someone say, oh, I paid an overdraft fee and I'm really glad that worked out. Yeah, that really worked out well for me. I have never seen the bumper sticker, I heart junk fees, right? How about you, Mr. Suero? Anybody you know? who is excited about being gouged by a multi-billion dollar bank? No, obviously not, and I wanna add two things. One is the CFPB received 57,000 comments from this, a vast majority, or a large number were from consumers that were saying quite the opposite, that they were fed up with these fees, that they didn't wanna pay them, they were very unpopular. The opposite is also true. If you ask consumers, how would you feel about a product that doesn't have such high late fees or low fees, they look at those products very favorably and they actually have more goodwill towards financial institutions if they were to be offered those products. Well, I'm really glad that the CFPB is taking up the fight on behalf of consumers and willing to stand up to these big banks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. More, uh, Senator Fetterman's recognized from Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I would like to thank my colleague from Connecticut for allowing to do this. Uh, yes, hi. Um, Banks seem to really, really, they love fees like that, right? I, I didn't. Um, I think uh, it's, it's helpful to, if something happens to you to really understand what a lot of other American consumers have, face that kinds of a thing. Uh, I'd say about 18, uh, well, probably a couple years ago, um, I was at a, a, a coffee place and, and I bought one and then everything went through. I didn't think anything of it. And then I had a notice that, that I overdraft my account. So that was, uh, that was a $40 cup of coffee. And then I wasn't at, at Blue Bottle. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but at any rate, uh, so is it pretty kind of, it seems kind of crazy that, um, uh, that uh, you would allow uh, your account to be uh, charged for, you know, Thirty-five dollars uh, over a cup of coffee, and of course, I didn't really appreciate it. So, who's in whose uh, in whose interest was that? Would you think? Uh, to, and uh, anyone, what do you thought about it? Um, so, it's it's in the interest of institutions that want to pad their profits with huge exorbitant fees. I think we shouldn't forget that during the time when, when you were experiencing your not blue bottle coffee overdraft, that many institutions were using low, uh, low to, high to low check reordering to actually trigger additional overdrafts. Yeah, well, and, and I, I, that's what I thought. And then I called up my bank and I'm like, well, hey, that's kind of, kind of crazy. And they're like, well, actually, sir, we allowed this transaction to occur and you were able to get on with your day. <laughs> and, and they actually, they, uh, they justify that by saying, well, that's a service that we provided that, that you were allowed to get your coffee and get on with your day. And, and then now it become very clear that these kinds of fees are a profit center. Is that accurate too? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the data from call reports reveals that the amount of fees coming in off of transaction accounts, in some cases can be 20, 30, 40% equivalent to the net income of that financial institution. Those are almost uh, overdraft stores. 
And, and it's, it's pure profit, too. I mean, it's no service, anything other than. It, it's, it's just being nickel and dimed. Uh, I personally don't enjoy that, being nickel and dimed. Uh, do, are any of you in the, the panel, do you enjoy being nickel and dimed anywhere you go? Mm, no, sir. No? Anyone? So, but now, uh, what once was something that was a penalty now has become uh, part of their, uh, their mission, is like to, 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 to that. And then this happened just last week uh, in my apartment. Um, the, D, the, DC, uh, the DC rental uh, market is it's kind of rough, and I'm, I'm, I pay $2,000 a month for 500 squares, uh, and then I left my key on the, the counter, and then I approached the front desk, and I'm like, could you please let me in so I can get my key? And they're like, well, absolutely. And then they pulled out a form that said, um, well, that's $50. I'm like, oh, no, no, I, I don't need another, I don't need a new key. I just, could you just let me in? And they're like, well, that doesn't matter. That's $50. And I'm like, $50 to, to let me in? Um, and, and I really couldn't believe that, that someone would charge uh, $50 just to open up to just get your, get your key. And, uh, and w would you agree that that's kind of a, a junk fee uh, for housing re rentals? Well, well, yes, absolutely, that's a, that's a junk fee. I feel bad for the person at the desk who had to follow the corporate policy that requires them to charge that fee. Well, yeah, sure of course, it's, yeah, it's not personal against the worker, but the fact that they, they institutionalized this idea that it's gonna, we're going to be $50 for letting you to just get your, your key there, uh, and that seems that's just pure profit, and that becomes that too. And metaphorically, and I know I'm running out of town, uh, time, but uh, I think that's the same kind of in, in a government where you cannot count or create like parking uh, tickets and sp speeding tickets as like a, as revenue that that should be about for public service or to to protect a situation um, and and it's it's in my opinion it's it's just gone crazy and now when billions and billions of dollars now those kinds of nickel and diming now is part of their their business strategy but uh, but thank you for joining me and and my time is is off. So Thanks, thank Senator Federman. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your testimony uh, today. I've been trying to listen in via C-SPAN, and I know a lot has been covered, of course, uh, on the issue of overdraft fees um, and and the finding that 80 percent of overdraft uh, fees are borne by 9 percent of customers, uh, which shows the uh, the impact of these fees on those who can least afford uh, to pay them. Uh, so that is why the CFPB uh, developed a rule uh, to address uh, this issue. Uh, Senator Booker and I organized a, a letter in April uh, in support of the CFPB rule. Uh, there's also been a lot of misinformation about the CFPB rule from opponents of it. Um, Mr. Rust, if you could just briefly uh, describe what the rule does and what it doesn't do. So thank you. So one of the things I like about the rule is how it creates multiple structures to fit different types of use cases and fit institutions and the different priorities they might have for their business. So there is the, the overdraft fee, which they describe as the courtesy overdraft fee, where for a benchmark rate, the institution's allowed to charge. And the, the, it's a proposal, so we don't know exactly what the rate will be. There's also an option to create an intentional line of credit, uh, an overdraft line of credit that comes with consumer protections. And so this is really moving in the direction that will be more about financial inclusion, not gotcha, but working together. And then there's a third aspect, which you might call a hybrid debit credit card that allows um, a consumer to overspend, but instead of having it be a negative balance, it creates a separate account that has credit and these are protected by um, important protections like no fee harvesters, no um, the, 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 an ability to repay standard, um, giving consumers time to repay, so a periodic statement, giving them um, the ability to choose how they repay their account so that they don't incur another overdraft fee. I appreciate that because, uh, as I said, and as you know, there's been a lot of misinformation. I think it's a very well-tailored and well-designed uh, proposal. I do want to turn briefly to the issue of junk fees 
as part of the rental housing uh, market. Uh, and the chairman of this committee has put a renewed focus uh, on housing. We're the banking and housing and urban affairs committee, and I appreciate that. And we've looked at ways to reduce the, the costs of housing, including rental housing, in terms of increasing the supply, uh, making sure that we have uh, voucher programs. But one of the other areas where we've seen big increases in the cost of housing is not only rents, uh, but in many of these sort of predatory uh, junk fees that's the topic of today's uh, discussion. So um, Mr. Rust and Mr. Suero, if you could just provide some of some examples of the most egregious uh, junk fees you've seen in the housing market. I know uh, some of them surfaced as part of the real page lawsuit. Maybe we should start with Mr. Suero or Mr. Rust, either one, whoever wants to go first. Um, Right, so there are additional costs being applied to home ownership that also raise the cost of housing. Um, one of the things that we're worried about is any situation where you have to pay to pay, and particularly if you have to pay to pay electronically, where the real cost of an ACH might be four and a half cents, but you have to pay seven or ten dollars. Uh, the CFPB has been working on addressing junk fees in the title insurance market. Title insurance is an interesting market where there are there are cross-competitive cross pressures. Loss ratios on title insurance could be between 3 and 5%. That's the amount of the premium paid that leads back to uh, a payment back to the consumer. Most of the fees in title insurance are going uh, to pay, uh, pay the institutions that led uh, to the, the, provided the lead generation for that title insurance policy. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Yeah, no, I'll just add, you know, in the rental market, things like application fees, late fees on your rent payments, utility fees, administ uh, administrative fees, right? I guess for, you know, the process of applying and things like this, um, those are the most common ones that we see. And again, you know, similar pattern to the other, to the banking junk fees, which is low income people across the board are paying those and, and Latinos and people of color are also paying those disproportionately. Thank you. Well, thank you for your work on this. And to the CFA, thank you and the team there uh, for what you're doing, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, thank Senator you. Von Holland. Senator Butler of California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, having this, this hearing. Um, and thank you all for your testimony and, and for your work. Um, I'd like to um, just associate myself with the uh, questioning uh, from Senator Van Holland relative to um, the rental market application fees and Mr. Suero, those that you just mentioned as they have just an incredibly um, impactful uh, impact on, uh, on young people in the country um, who are trying to find a way to do all the things that we expect them to do, save their money and be prepared for a rainy day and the $100 application fee or the $50 trash takeout uh, fee and so I appreciate the your comment um, specifically to that market and and to those uh, young people because I think there are some things that that we can and should be doing. Let me turn to actually Mr. Suero where you left off the notion of disproportionate impact um, and uh, racial wealth gaps relative to uh, junk fees. The Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances show that while the wealth of black and Hispanic households grew at a faster rate than the wealth of white households, disparities continue to persist, in part due to the proliferation of junk fees. Consumers of color are often pushed out of mainstream financial products into fringe financial services and predatory financial products, including high-cost loans and credit cards. You know this as uh, well as I do, uh, and thank you for helping my team facilitate that financial literacy webinar last week. Mr. Suero, Mr. Rust, uh, either of you can take the question, but what are the ways that junk fees perpetuate existing racial wealth gaps and hinder generational wealth building? Yeah, so, um, so I wanna start on the access side first. So we've cited already today um, that high costs are one of the big 
uh, barriers to obtaining these products. So we know from the uh, FDIC survey, we've done surveys, if you just go out and ask people, why don't you have a bank account? They'll cite cost as one of the biggest barriers. I don't want to pay, you know, there's, it's too expensive to pay for an overdraft fee or, or a monthly maintenance fee, that type of thing. Same thing for credit card uh, uh, products. They'll tell you the same thing. It's too expensive, interest rates are too high, credit card late fees are too high. So on the one hand, we're creating a situation in which low-income people and people of color disproportionately are left out because they're concentrated in those working-class, you know, low-income jobs. Um, so that's on, on the one hand. They have, and if you look at the access to those products, they're always, they always have the least amount of access to those products. In the bigger picture, in terms of wealth, um, you know, the people who do have these products are also paying the highest fees and the highest costs. And so, you know, you think about what's going on in that situation. This is a, you know, a continual process where working class people, people of color are paying a lot more, a bigger percentage of their money back into financial institutions. And oftentimes it's the biggest financial institutions. We're talking multi-billion, you know, trillion dollar uh, institutions that are getting that back that money. So it's a, it's a wealth extraction and it's also a financial exclusion uh, process. Thank you for that, Mr. Rust. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts um, to that question. And um, I, I have done some work to uh, introduce a set of bills uh, relative to uh, expanding language inclusivity um, and making sure that we are making uh, the information much more accessible to people whose language is uh, first language is not English. And so. I would love to have you combine these two uh, issues um, for me, if you, uh, if you can. Why, how and why are we here, and then what are things like language access and, and ways that, that um, companies continue to take advantage of, of these communities? So sure, thank you. I'll start with the first half and touching on a bit of what Santi said, but adding the, the Gen Z and, and millennials face a housing market that's dramatically different than what generations before did. Currently, something like 30% of Gen Z after, after high school or college are living with their parents. And this is really about a lack of supply of housing, right? But this means that they're not getting on the escalator to home ownership, to wealth building, to all the, all the aspects of what we associate with the American dream. So re related to your question, these, these new generations, younger generations, are more diverse, right? The bargain they're seeing isn't the same bargain. And so to the point about making sure that financial institutions use inclusive language, well, this is very important. We've worked a lot um, in, in, over time in, in things like adverse action notices, right? When you are turned down for credit, well, why were you turned down for credit? Well, if it's in English, that doesn't really help if you're someone who comes from a family that speaks a different language, right? This is, this is vitally important to being fair. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Senator Butler. Uh, thank you all for being here for uh, good questions. I appreciated so many people, especially on, on this side of the aisle, um, with such good questions. Appreciated the involvement of, of everyone on this committee. Uh, senators who wish to submit questions for the hearing record, they're due one week from today, March, uh, May 9th. Uh, to the witnesses, please submit your responses to the questions uh, within 45 days from the day you receive them. Uh, thank you all again. With that, the hearing's adjourned.